You'll find that in your Pew Bibles on page 1183. 1183. So please stand for the reading of the word. And that is Revelation 13, uh, uh, 13, 11 to 14. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonder, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell to the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word, and you may now be seated. We got a green light there. Wolf. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Dear Father in heaven, we always uh, remember that we are in a house of prayer. And so, Lord, this morning it is our privilege to come to you and to ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us here in this place. And that's what we're asking. And we're asking also for the presence of holy angels that excel in strength to be here as well and uh, to guard and protect us, but also to help us to understand the things that you have for us. Lord, I pray for clear, connected thoughts, and I pray that you will help me to simply convey the things that you have conveyed to me. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time I was here, uh, we spoke anyway, was on uh, Daniel. Daniel 1 through 6 as a type. And so the, we looked at um, the role of the United States of America in the upcoming Sunday Law. And in looking at that in Daniel 1 through 6 as a type, Uh, Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 were two very specific points in time that for God's people. So Daniel 3, there were represented in the scriptures as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's interesting that they would use those names. But they represent Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three people represent um, God's people at a very specific point in time. And that specific point in time is the, if you recall, uh, the spirit of prophecy tells us that the raising of the image 
on the plain of Dura is the same as the raising of the Sunday law. So that gives us the reference point we needed to understand that. And so those three men were there at the raising of the image on the plain of Dura. And so representing the raising of the Sunday law, the national Sunday law that comes in effect in the United States of America. And then we went to Daniel 6, and you see Daniel on the scene then, no Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just Daniel. And um, <coughs> likewise with the first test in Daniel 3, Daniel was not present at, at, that the Bible records. So the first test uh, in Daniel 3 was a revealing test. So at that point, until the decree went forth, the music played, no one knew who would bow down and who would not. And so it identified a group of people this Daniel, in Daniel 3. And then when you get to Daniel 6, there it's another test, but a people have already been identified, and so it is a targeted test. Now, when this Sunday law comes through, the universal Sunday law, the second part of it, the world knows who these people are. And so now it's a targeted test. And so, and remember that Daniel was represented as without fault, without error. So when the test came in Daniel 3, with the three Hebrews, there were, they were not sealed. They were not represented as a sealed people. God's people are not sealed at this point. It's the great test for God's people. And if you're sealed, you cannot fail the test. But it is the great test. So we have all of us the opportunity to pass or fail this test. When these three Hebrews were put in the furnace, in the fiery furnace, remember two things were removed from them as a result of passing through the fiery furnace. This is part of the sealing process. And the two things that were removed from them were the mighty men that bound them, that had a hold of them, that threw them into the, into the fiery furnace. And the other thing that were removed from them were the bands that bound them. There were two things that were taken from them as a result of passing through the fiery furnace. And so for us, at the end of time, there are two things that need to be removed from us. And those are the inherited defects of character that we all possess. And those are, they're also the inherited, the cultivated defects of character. We take these inherited defects of character that are handed to us from our birth, something that we get that we don't, we don't get any choice in the matter. And then depending on how you're raised, depending on your experience, whether you engage in the battle of of overcoming those defects of character or whether they're cultivated through our adult life. And I would safely, I think it's a safe thing to say with the majority of us that um, we've cultivated, a lot of us, our, unfortunately, our defects of, uh, of character. An interesting way to look at that is uh, Joseph. You know, if you recall, he had a coat of many colors. And it was handed to him from his father. His father is the one that gave him that coat of many colors. It's not a white coat, not white like a sheep, but a coat of many colors. And so it represents, in some ways, it represents those things, represent the, the iniquities of the father handed down to the third and fourth generation. And we're going to look at that a little bit today uh, in, a, in a different light. Um, so... As a result of that trial, as a result of this thing, there's a little time of trouble, and then there's the great time of trouble, Jacob's time of trouble. And in this process, God has a way to purge his people of all of the earthliness, worldliness, and um, defects of character, and on and on. It is important to realize that these three Hebrews did not simply get to experience this test without first having passed through Daniel chapter 1, the test on appetite, and Daniel chapter 2, the test on prophecy and presumption. It follows closely with the, with the temptations of Christ in the wilderness. And so these men had already passed through testing processes before they even came 
to this test of the Sunday law, this raising of the image on the plain of Dura. And so for us, it's uh, a mistake to think that somehow around the Sunday law, God is simply going to do a work for us that will purge us of our defects of character, that somehow we'll just be good. That is a mistake. The thing to understand is that we're to be preparing now as we, as we speak. We're to be passing through these processes just like the Hebrews passed through. Each one of those tests, if you search it out in the scriptures, Daniel 1 was a life or death test. And Daniel 2 was a life or death test. Daniel 3 was a life or death test. Daniel 6 was a life or death test. So the same is true for each one of us. And so we looked at that, and we looked at the role of the United States. And remember that, um, that uh, the three Hebrews did not bow down to the image. And as a result, they were called to the king, and the king gave them a second chance. And in that second chance, we realize that the same thing will occur in the United States of America that there will be a people that are identified that will not bow to the Sunday law, but then they will be brought in to the, the attorneys, the courts of law, all of these things, and given a second chance. And the reason they're given a second chance is because the protection of the U.S. Constitution is still available to, this, to us, to this people. But then if you recall, Nebuchadnezzar spake. His countenance changed towards those three, and he spake. And if you read the inspired counsel on it, his, he anticipated somehow God was going to intervene in their behalf. And his countenance became as the countenance of a demon. That's what Mrs. White records for us. And so his countenance changed, he spake, then commanded to throw them in. And that is the precise point when the Constitution of the United States of America will be repudiated. The United States will change its countenance toward these people. It will speak, and when it speaks, the U.S. Constitution will be repudiated and the protection withdrawn from God's people in that respect. And then when you went to Daniel 6, if you recall, um, the same thing occurred. Darius, remember, he worked to the going down of the sun. He tried to save Daniel. It's the representation now of the thing going to the United Nations or whatever governing body will be in the world, and it's the UN uh, human rights provision. It test, is tested, but it also is repealed. And remember, the death decree goes out. The writing goes forth against God's people. You can see the same concepts, the same type, in the story of Esther. You know, so Esther, they had, this is the same thing. She makes, Mrs. White makes the case that Mordecai, the writing that goes forth, is a representation of the death decree that goes out in the final portion of the Sunday Law. And so you can make the exact same, it's, it's interesting, only you see different facets of how these things will work. One deals with the United States of America, Daniel. The other in Esther deals with the last kingdom on earth the United Nations controlled by the papal power. And so you get, you get insights as to what it is to expect. We can make no predictions based on time, but God takes care to show his people what it is they can expect and how it is to prepare for it. And so he does not leave us, he does not leave us um, hanging. So there's a, I'm going to read just a little bit here, if I can find it, um, from Great Controversy. She goes on to, she tells us, let's see if I can find this. <clears throat> the events connected, she, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. And the time of trouble 
will find them unready. And so in the scriptures and in the spirit of prophecy, we are given the events that are connected with the close of probation and also the work of preparation to ensure that we pass through these times. But multitudes have no more understanding of these things. She makes many, many statements in regard to some of these um, things. One of them is in the testimonies, in five testimonies, that many of us will be brought before people of influence when this time period happens to give a reason for our faith, to show from the scriptures why we believe what we believe. And she goes on to say that many, many will be astonished to realize they can't explain it, that they've assumed these things, that they've bought into them from the church, but that they themselves do not understand. They can't, they cannot give an intelligent reason for their faith. And as a result, they're overcome. They can't, they're, they're out-argued, out-debated, out-maneuvered, and they're confused, and they give up their faith. And so it's very important that we study for ourselves. Um, we are a movement based on prophecy, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And not only are we a movement based on prophecy, but we are also to be the premier interpreter of prophecy. We as a church, that's not a statement made in arrogance. That is simply God has given this church the prophetic gift. And so we should understand prophecy more than any other people on the earth. <coughs> so there is going to be, let's see here, I'm going to read, there's three persecuting powers that, that have affected and afflicted God's people. And I'm going to read just a little bit here, um, I can find it here. So there's three persecuting powers. One is paganism, the other is papalism, and the other is apostate Protestantism. The beast with the lamb-like horns, the United States of America under the control of fallen Protestant churches. The first persecuting power is represented by the dragon itself. In heathenism, there was an open alliance with Satan and an open defiance of God. In the second persecuting power, the dragon is masked, but the spirit of Satan actuates it. The dragon supplies the motive power. In the third persecuting power, the time in which we live, <coughs> all traces of the dragon are absent, and a lamb-like beast appears. But when it speaks... Its dragon voice betrays the satanic power concealed under a fair exterior and shows it to be of the same family as the two preceding powers. In all the opposition to Christ and his pure religion, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, the god of this world, is the moving power. So we have the three main persecuting powers. And it's interesting, paganism, and paganism is a very distinct thing, Paganism is represented here. I use these charts. They're, um, they were used many years before me. This is the 1843 and the 1850 chart. And literally, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And you can get these charts still through um, Adventist Heritage Ministries. It's an official arm of the Adventist Church. But <coughs> paganism, when concerning God's people, when Israel went into captivity, followed by Judah going into captivity with Assyria, then it was Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. So paganism are the first four. It's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. And when you run that out, it's kind of interesting in in uh, when Israel went into captivity in 723 BC, then you run that down to 538, the setting up of the papacy, you have 1260 year span. And then when you go to the next persecuting power of the papacy, it goes from 538 
1780 to 1798 AD, another 1260 year time period. So it's kind of interesting, the two different uh, persecuting powers. On this chart, the uh, image of the papacy, which we're dealing with today, the image to the beast, is represented, it's interesting, it is, the, it is the papacy, but remember it's the image to the papacy. So I don't know if anybody, I hope everybody can see these okay, but <coughs> this beast is <coughs> a different kind of beast, um, as are several of them. It has a, a leopard's body, it has a lion's mouth, it has bear's feet, and so it's an interesting animal this thing. And it's interesting the location of this animal in uh, relevance to this, to this line here. This is 1844, this line that comes down here. And so this, this beast is just before 1844 where it starts to make its appearance. And if you recall, uh, in when the messages were given, by the way, these charts, this first chart, the 1843 chart, has the first and second angels messages on that chart. And this chart, the 1850 chart, has the first and second angels combined now with the third angel's message on there. The 1843 chart is the one that was used by the Millerites. And so they spoke, the first and second angel's messages went to all the Protestant churches of their time in the 1840 to 1844 time period. And so they spoke off of this chart showing clearly where everyone was in the stream of time. And so they, they were able, when they would just hang that chart up, wherever they could hang it, uh, you read, read, read mention of it in several of our pioneers writing, they would hang it up in a blacksmith shop, or mechanic shop, wherever they'd hang it up, and pretty soon the crowds would attract, and they would begin to preach off of this chart. This one was not in existence until 1850, and the third angel's message didn't come in until after 1844. So the location of this this animal here, this apostate, the image to the beast here, it's just before 1844 when this thing began to emerge. And you can't, I'm sure you can't see it from here, but it has two little horns, you know, showing the, what we just read for the scripture reading. You know, two, you know, two horns like a lamb, two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon. So <clears throat> when, they, when they showed the information on this chart, they could clearly show where they were in the stream of time. They could show a couple of things. They could show that Jesus was about to come. They could show the signs that had fulfilled, showing very clearly, and which then allowed them to show that no one was ready for that event. And so the same is true with us. And so they were able to show that, uh, the, remember the Jews of their time, they, their message was based on the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. And they had the 70 weeks, that was their present truth at that time. The Millerites, their present truth was the end of the 2300 day prophecy, the close of it, and which we now know was the beginning of the investigative judgment. In their time, they thought that Christ was returning back to earth at that point in time. But they were able to show clearly the events. They were able to show the fulfillment of the 70 weeks. They were able to show that Christ was coming back. They also had two woes. They had the woes, and if we're familiar with the woes, the, the, uh, the first woe is Mohammedism. The second woe was the Ottoman Empire. The third woe is modern Islam. And I think we talked about that the last time that I, I had spoken here as well. So if you, what's interesting is, is there's a horseman, horseman, and then no horseman. And horsemen, horsemen, no horsemen. First, second woe, but no third. Because the arrival of the third woe had not arrived in these time periods. It wasn't, it wasn't here on, on earth. It had not arrived in history. So they could show, and they took, remember, uh, Josiah Litch. He did the prophecy that showed to the day the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The conclusion of the second woe. And it established, it was the impetus to the first angel's message. It established the year-day principle. It gave validity to that so that everyone that heard that message understood 
that they could predict from Scripture these events to the day. And it gave a great impetus to the message. And so when they did that, thousands were converted. And we know in the Protestant churches, if I recall, I could be off on this, but it was upwards of 250 to 60,000 people that were brought out of those churches that were that converted to the Advent message. In the end, only 50 of them went through. Only 50 went on, and, uh, which is a sad, sad note. So back to the emergence of this, this, this thing, this was happening in that time period. The reason this happened up in this area just before 1844 was due to the rejection of the message by the then known Protestant churches, which we were all, whoever, Adventists, whoever you want to be, were all part of those churches. There was no distinction. And they rejected the first and second angels' messages as they arrived in history. And when they rejected that, we read in the, the great controversy that they experienced a moral fall. And as they have continued to reject the special truths for this time, they have fallen lower and lower to where they are in darkness. I always want to be careful when we talk about Protestantism, we talk about Catholicism, we talk about any of these things. It's the system that we refer to, not the people. You know? And so I always, at this point, I always like to insert a statement made by the spirit of prophecy, and she makes it very clear that in the communion of the Protestant churches, not accepting the Roman Catholic Church, also in the Roman Catholic Church, there are more of God's people in that communion than there are in the Adventist church. And so that should be a sobering thing for us. And so I always want to make sure it's easy, and we live in a world today of PC, political correct. This, you know, and so I don't ever want to be misunderstood. We are, we are never to aim our guns at people. Never to aim our guns at the people, and it's a system that we're dealing with here. And so I hope that comes across okay and clear because uh, I'm sure that I'm among all of us that have very dear friends in these different churches. But, having said all of that, a message still goes forth to call those dear people out of this system. So that makes sense. That's what this message did. And it's interesting, we're not going to go into this study today, but you can see that with Samson's foxes. Remember that story? the 300 foxes, and I've shared, I think, some of that here in prayer meetings and such, but remember, he got 300 foxes. In the Millerite time period, there were 300 80, 1843 charts that were, that were lithiographed, 300. So 300 foxes. The foxes, remember, Samson tied them tail to tail, and they ran as a pair through the Philistine uh, orchards and wheat and all of that, representing that there are the first and second angel's messages. So these two angels ran as a pair through the Protestant churches and resulted in bringing out the harvest, just like with Samson foxes. Burned up the harvest, bringing them out, so to speak. He was the destroyer of their country. <laughs> these charts were the destroyer of that era of Protestantism. It brought out a people. So it's interesting to think. One last thing I want to say about these charts is the fact that they do have the first, second, and third angel's message uh, on them. But Mrs. White makes an interesting statement that these charts, when we, when we study them out, she says the mind, in looking at these charts, even the visual of these charts, the mind is imperceptibly drawn to heaven, which I have found very interesting. And I ask that. When I'm, when I'm studying out, when I'm looking at some of these things, I ask that my mind would be imperceptibly be drawn to heaven, uh, regardless of me. So this beast, this, this thing, is what we're wanting to look at here. What is it, this system, that we are, what is this that confronts us as Adventism? This system. And so rem remember in the, 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 the man of sin, the mystery of iniquity, the Roman Catholic, the papal uh, system has been the focus of a lot of different uh, talks, uh, even with the Millerites back in the day, 
but this, this focus is beginning to change some now. And, and, and back in the Millerite day, they were the first ones that identified that Protestantism had become confusion. That it did not have the message. It rejected the message, therefore became confusion. The system did. A moral fall is an interesting thing to study out. There's a moral in the civil law. And so the moral law is, remember there's the letter of the law, but then there's the spirit of the law. And so, so the moral law, I don't think any of us here kill or do those things. I think we, can, we, we keep the commandments, so to speak. But then there's the letter of the law, the law that's written upon our hearts. And, and if I think evil of my brother, I've just been as guilty as if I killed my brother. And if I look inappropriately at a woman, I'm just as guilty as a committing adultery. And so the moral fall is the loss of the ability to distinguish spiritually the law, this, this, this moral uh, fall that happened. So this system, if you study this thing out, why does it have a lion's mouth, and why does it have a leopard's body, and why does it standing on the feet of a bear? This, so if you go into the place where that is detailed, it's in Daniel, you find that there's, we have historically, and it's very true, we've understood these kingdoms, uh, starting with the statue, then with the animals, um, as literal kingdoms, and rightfully so, in prophecy, and, but there's more to it than, than that. And so the, the leopard is Greece. It's the it is the, it's no, Greece is what the leopard is on the chart. And so what is the distinguishing characteristic of Greece? What, what, why, what would be here that we would understand from here that would affect us? And so Greece, maybe I'll back up a little bit. Babylon was known for what? Recall, remember why Nebuchadnezzar had to be out for his seven years and get his lesson do you remember why, what his great sin was? Pride. And when he was finished with his punishment, he was able to make a statement that God is able to abase pride. He, it, it, the, it worked, and his pride was humbled. And so pride is the, is the leading characteristic of Babylon. So in this case, with this animal, it has a mouth of a lion, so it speaks great pride. It's a, it's a proud thing. The next one is standing on, it's standing on bear's feet. So the bear, we go up, and it's Medo-Persia. And so what, in Medo-Persia, what would be the leading characteristic of Medo-Persia? If you were to stop and think about that. If you read it in several places in Daniel, um, when the king of Medo-Persia, when he issued a decree or a command, could you change it? Do you recall? No, it was unalterable. Remember when the law went out, it was infallible. It's an infallible thing. He, when it speaks, it's infallible. There's no altering of the law. A counterman can go, but it's, it's, so it's infallible. So this, this animal speaks with pride, spiritual pride, but is standing on a platform of infallibility. And then the body is from Greece. And what is Greece known for? It, it's, what is its leading characteristic of Greece? If you stop and think about it. So Greece has, if, it's very interesting with this power of Greece, it is the only one that's noted that bears rule over all the earth. Greece bears rule over all the earth. It doesn't say that about Babylon, Medo-Persia, or Rome. It's the Greece bears rule over all the earth. Almost all, without exception, of our educational system in the world has its, basically you can trace its origins back to Greece, to philosophical, and the thing about the educational programs of 
Greece is that it always exalts human reasoning in place of divine revelation. So it's, if you, it's interesting. I have not put this together well enough in a study to be able to actually document it as yet, but I'm close. And so we always, if Greece, if you recall, there's, there's four heads. And remember, uh, we, in, in, our, in our typical Adventist prophecy, which is correct, uh, I always agree, uh, representing the four generals when Alexander was, when he died, and then the four generals stepped in and took over the kingdom and did what they did, representing the four heads, four heads of government. But these wings are, are rarely dealt with. And wings, we usually just write them off. Well, it was just the speed, of the, the speed in which they conquered. And, and, I, and I, don't, I don't disagree with that. But there's four wings for a reason. And when you study it out, uh, there's four men in particular. I'm not going to say they're the, the founders, but I would say close. There's Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and Origen. The four leading great men of Greece that almost all of our educational system is derived from, in some form, whether from kindergarten on up through our major universities. Doesn't matter what flavor the university, doesn't matter what brand, doesn't matter whether it's state, doesn't matter whether it's private. It's like it has been, and, and I, I've heard, I've, I've done actually tremendous research on this, and, and uh, a good book that sets forth the educational system, the papal education system, is written by one of our top educators back in the day, E.A. Sutherland. And uh, he was one of our top uh, Adventist educators. And uh, the book is called Living Fountains, Broken Cisterns. And he details the, the um, effect of the Grecian educational system on us. And so it is a system on false education, based on false education. So this, we're being confronted here by a system that speaks with pride, by a system that stands infallible, and that has for its body a system of false education. That's what we're being confronted with as a people when this thing, when, when, we're, when it comes toward us. Where, where I'm coming to understand, so how many, how many are how many are engaged in any way in a study of Daniel 11? Anybody study in Daniel 11? Okay. And Daniel 11, if we recall, um, contains the last unfulfilled portion of prophecy. So Mrs. White lets us know that. And so it's, it's present truth. It's our present truth. Just as the Jews' present truth was derived from Daniel uh, 9, and the Millerites' present truth was derived from Daniel 8. Our present truth is derived from Daniel 11. And so there are many people worldwide studying out this prophecy of Daniel 11 and uh, trying to understand how it applies to us, how, how this system works and how it, what it does. And so in my <laughs> research on this, I have, I have looked at our um, Adventist positions on Daniel 11. And there are um, three prevailing um, interpretations, I think, right now. On, uh, I, I know that for a fact, in Adventism. And uh, they all three, none of them agree. And all three of them um, have a different take, particularly on the kings of the north and kings of the south and even on the king of verse 36, Daniel 11, 36. But they all are accepted within Adventism, which is an interesting thing. And uh, they're accepted, and even as high up as our BRI. You know, they, they will not come out definitively and say, they're, oh, well, it, it could be this, you know, what? And, and they have a good point there, and it could be this, and you know what, we just can't say because we might be wrong. And that's, that's the official take. Remembering, again, that we are to be the premier interpreter of prophecy. If you recall, Daniel and his friends were. And, and if you recall, when Daniel interpreted the prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar, he got the statement of a truth it is, your God is a God of gods. 
you are able to interpret this thing. You know, so that's the position we should be having. But unfortunately, we don't. And so the question is, why? Why is it that we don't have that? Why is it that we are in, uh, the best word I would know to use, why do we waffle on the interpretation of this, pro this prophecy? So it's interesting to me, as I have studied this out, I have come to realize that it has everything to do with the methodology that we use. The methodology that is employed in the giving, in the interpretation of this prophecy is, let me say it this way, the method that you use will determine the conclusion that you reach. Right? You know, so, so you, if you, depending on what method you use, will determine the outcome of your prophetic understanding. And so the question then becomes, which methodology do we use? Which one, which one passes muster? What I'm beginning to realize is that we are buying into this system as Adventists, wholesale. We're buying into this system of methodology. So the Adventist position on some of these is not much different than the Protestant positions. And, and, and as I find it very interesting and actually a little on the sad side. And so my quest has been to employ a methodology that heaven has shown us in order to correctly understand these prophecies. <coughs> so, I'm going far away from where I designed to go. This rise of apostate Protestantism this rise of this system will culminate in something. And it will, it will culminate in the Sunday Law. It will culminate in this United States of America speaking as a dragon. It will culminate there. And it will, as a result of, as a result of the methods that have been used, the interpretations that have been reached, it will be concluded that uh, we must have a Sunday law here in the United States of America. And that's the only way that we can save our country. And I don't know if you have looked at it, but the main reason for the insistence on a Sunday law is a return to temporal prosperity. There's a loss of temporal prosperity. And so the people begin to clamor for this return to temporal prosperity. And as a result, there's a grassroots movement and uh, legislators are, have pressure applied to them to do this uh, Sunday law. So we looked at, we looked at um, in Daniel 3, Daniel 6, we looked at the role of the United States of America in and how the Constitution would be repudiated Today, what do we see going on in our United States of America? And I, I know that's a, that's a vague question to ask. <clears throat> when you consider Daniel 11, the prophecy of Daniel 11, you must also consider the king of the north, king of the south. You must consider the king of verse 36. And there's a lot of speculation out there about Russia, about Islam, about atheism, about all these different players that could possibly be these things. In the United States of America right now, there is two powers that are contending for control of the United States of America. And those two powers, one is this apostate Protestantism, the other is, it's an interesting thing, it's separate and distinct from this paganism, but it is atheism. It's a power that's contending for, for um, the control of the United States of America. Not as the king of the north, not as the king of the south. Simply a power that's contending for the control of the United States. The, some insights on this are the French Revolution. 
And so, do you recall, if you read in the Great Controversy, what happened in the French Revolution, what the causes were that caused that to happen? I don't know if anyone has studied that out, but as I've studied it out, I've begun to understand a couple of things. And so I want to read a statement here. Um, it says, the war against the Bible, carried forward for so many centuries in France, culminated in the scenes of the revolution. That terrible outbreaking was but the legitimate result of Rome's suppression of the scriptures. It presented the most striking illustration which the world has ever witnessed of the working out of the papal policy. An illustration of the results for which more than a thousand years the teaching of the Roman church had been tending. And so this thing that happened in France in the revolution was a direct result of an outworking of the papal policy. So whatever the, whatever the papacy had put in place produced this thing this revolution. It produced it. And, and uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to look into. So when it did this, it, and, and we're told, as you read this chapter, and we're also told in Revelation, it is atheism. This was a, and Mrs. White tells us, this here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power, atheism. So atheism now is a player, and atheism, it's interesting what it did, um, it, one of the first things that it does, these, uh, these coupled with the policy of Rome, is the first thing it did in France was took down the marriage institution. That's, uh, it, uh, it, it, we, we read that intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage, the most sacred engagement which human beings can form, and the permanence of which leads most strongly to the consolidation of society. To the state, it reduced it to a state of a mere civil contract of a transitory uh, character that any two persons could engage in and cast loose at pleasure. So one of the things that this policy, this papal policy accomplished was the destruction of the marriage institution. And the marriage institution, we can read it in many places, is what underpins society. It's what keeps us together, the marriage, the family. And, but that's one of the first things that was removed. And, uh, and, and sh they go, she goes on to say that they could not have invented a more effectual plan to take down this place than the degradation of marriage. The other thing that was put in place as a result of this uh, policy was the licentiousness of France. Remember? And so they, they I'm not going to go into the details of that. I think we all get it. In the United States of America today, we see the marriage institution has been degraded unbelievably, but we also see the licentiousness. We see the, and I'm, again, systems I speak of, not people, and uh, the gay agendas, and the, all of these different things you see, particularly on the democratic platform, you see this, the same things that are occurring in the United States of America that occurred in France. So to look at that, to understand that a little bit, the papal policy has been one always of education. There's, there's, how would I say this? It was a policy to have more children than anybody else to, to overcome by sheer numbers. If you follow, you're going to have more babies than anybody else has, Catholic babies, and so you take over a nation that way. Well, they realize that doesn't work, though they tried. <laughs> so what they really realized is, is that they had to get the minds of the children, and they did that through the system of education, starting from pre-kindergarten all the way on up. They go for the mind. And, and the papal policy, remember, is the suppression of the scriptures, which then produces this licentiousness, and it produces this degradation of marriage. And the, the, the degradation of marriage is the number one thing that underpins society. So in this system, 
what I'm finding is there are, we're going to read it quickly, and I, I don't want to go too far on it, but in Daniel 11, there's two things to see in relation to what we're discussing today. In Daniel 11, um, verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So you have a couple of things introduced here. And it's interesting, there, but in his estate, this is the papacy that's being spoken of, the king of verse 36, and, but now it's but in his estate. There's a different administrator now, which is Protestantism, the daughters. And uh, I always like, let me see if I can find it here. Um, let's see here. Here. Uh, it's, this is from Spalding and McGann, Mrs. White speaking. I saw that the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth and that his power was in his head, and that the decree would go out of his mouth. Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. She has had her day, and it is past. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. I saw that as the mother has been declining in power, the daughters have been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. So you have a transition. The papacy, its day is done. And you can show, you know, in Revelation 17, 10, remember there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when it comes it must continue a short space. And so you can show the seven kings, you can show the five that are fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Papal, papal Rome, the five are fallen. And then one is. And who is, what's the next beast on the scene? It's the one that we read about earlier, the two-horned beast. It's us, it's the United States of America. We're number six. <clears throat> and so, the, the papacy had its day. It's still in, it still is a player, of course, but it is switched. And that's the point I am hoping to be able to make here before we're done is that this beast is now in play. It's the system, the false education, the pride, the infallibility, the image to the beast. This is the one that concerns us. Is the papacy in control of all of this? Absolutely. But it uses Protestantism as its vehicle to deliver directly to us. It's how it works. And, and so in, in this, this system... When you look at the papacy, it's, it is in the background now. And, but it's still calling the shots. And, it's still, and so it has put in place its papal policy. It learned. And remember the papacy in the spirit of prophecy, marvelous in its cunning and shrewdness is the papacy. And it, she can read what is to be. She knows she can do that. She deals in terms of centuries. We don't. And so she's put into play, there are two things occurring in the United States of America. Atheism, and atheism as a result of the papal policy, the educational system that is in, in, uh, in the United States of America and worldwide. And then there's apostate Protestantism. And so you see it in our two platforms, Democrats, Republicans. And not saying that if you're a Democrat, you're atheist, and not saying if you're Republican, you're a Christian nationalist. But... When you put the two together, you see they're very two uh, opposing ideologies. And so this ideology, you have the atheism on the one side, taking away marriage, instituting the gay rights, um, no scriptures, no Bible in a church or in the schools, uh, completely secular educational systems, on and on and on and on and on. The other side of it, the Republican side, you see the equally in another ditch, you see the push, and you're going to see the pendulum come. You see the atheism is doing its thing, and remember that it produced this war in France. And we know, we know that there will be a civil war again here 
the United States of America. This policy works. And so the papacy understands well, so how would I say this? It is employing atheism as its tool, also employing Protestant America. It's employing both. It understands how to do this. It understands how to take the principles, its policy, and atheism, and to create the, the conditions that, are necessi that become necessary in order for a Sunday law to come into being. So I hope that makes sense. And, and so it knows how to do that. It knows how to destroy and take down a country. It knows how to do that. And, and marvelous in its shrewdness, and it can read what is to be. And if you recall, uh, we talked about this briefly. If you recall, uh, I don't know how many it is now, uh, how many of the, uh, on the Supreme Court justices are Catholic. I don't remember. At one time it was seven out of nine. I don't know what it is now. It's up there. And so it, it knows, it realizes that at some point there's going to be a challenge to the U.S. Constitution. It knows that. It realizes, it sees, it knows what atheism is doing. It knows that a pendulum is going to swing with Protestant America, and it knows what the result's going to be. And then when that result happens, it knows that there's going to be a test to the U.S. Constitution. And so it is in place, guaranteed, to see to it that this thing gets repudiated. Seven out of the nine justices. And so it's interesting to put those things together. It's interesting to see. And so the point is, this system of apostate Protestantism, the system, the methodologies, all of it, what we should be seeing is that, and I'm just going to say it as I see it, that it is not our friend. It's not a friend of Adventism. Nothing against the people. I, but even more than not being a friend to Adventism, it is positively an enemy to Adventism. This, this system, these study methods, these, the way they approach, and it's an interesting thing. I'll say this, and I, this, this will probably uh, not set well with some people, but one of Rome's policies was to suppress the scriptures. Does that happen today? Are the scriptures suppressed today? I mean, how many, ver how many Bibles do we have in our homes? We have Bibles. An interesting thing to consider is the many, many different versions of the Bible. And these different versions of the Bible bring confusion to the truth rather than clarity. It doesn't bring clarity to the truth. If you think about it, most all of these new versions of the Bible came after and came from the fall of apostate Protestantism. So, in other words, when after they fell, that's when their Bible houses started putting out these different versions. And, uh, and so it's interesting. So uh, it's something to consider. Uh, for me personally, um, I, of course, go with the King James, but that's just my own personal take because it is tried and true. You know, and so these different versions, I don't know, I remember being at a church in Florida, a pretty large church a number of years ago, and the a woman got up to do the scripture reading. And so she asked that everybody would read along with her out loud. <laughs> so there was probably 30 different versions of scripture in that house. You know, and so you can imagine it was a discordant, no one could understand uh, what was being said. So, so I'm going to stop there on the atheism, the paganism. The one thing I would say about atheism and versus paganism, atheism is distinct from paganism. So let me say it this way. These, these paganistic powers, they believed in a god. They might not have believed in our god, but they believed in a god. They believed in the rain god, the sun god, the fertility god. They believed in gods. They believed in supernatural power. Atheism, on the other hand, believes in no god. Evolution, no god, period. You know, and so it's very distinct from, uh, from paganism. And if you're, if you're studying it in what we just read in, in Daniel, it is the strange God. It's a strange God. 
because it's atheism. It's a strange God. It's not a God, but it's a strange God. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. And it's a God that his fathers knew not. And so the fathers of the papacy, these are the fathers of the papacy. And it's a God that these fathers knew not. They didn't know atheism. They knew paganism. And so it's interesting to put those points together and uh, start piece by piece to, uh, to, and that's associated with the God of forces and a uh, very interesting study there too with evolution and, and other things. So a question that, that comes to my mind, and I'm going to close with this, is um, how will it be in our church? So this system that will produce, there's ever two classes of people. And those who, um, those who are saved and those who are not, basically, but there's two classes of people. And, and, and I, I never like to speak based from fear. You know, it's like, but I also, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, if the Titanic was going down, uh, would I prefer that someone timidly knocked on my door and said, excuse me, sir, but I might want to get up. Or would I prefer that someone came in and grabbed me by my ankles and yanked me out of bed and put me in a lifeboat? You know, which would I prefer? And so, obviously, I would prefer to know <laughs> and to be safe. And so, I, I, don't, I don't believe in speaking uh, in terms of fear, to get people afraid and that kind of thing. But what I do believe is, if I have cancer, I want to know it. You know, and so some of the statements that are made, Mrs. White was shown that, when you, when you, well, let me say it this way. When you look in history, there is how many people got on Noah's, Noah's Ark out of all the antediluvian world? Eight. How many people escaped from Sodom and Gomorrah out of all those people? How many people actually went in in the Millerites, actually escaped out of that system? That escaped is a very interesting concept. And so never, you don't want to be number nine. You don't want to be number four. You don't want to be number 51. You know, we want to be in. We want to know our salvation. We want to know that, that we are um, in of the Lord. So in my studies, and again, I'm going to close with this, there... In Christ's time, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in our time, there's, you can look at it in two different ways. Whether you can look at the United States of America, there's Democrats and there's Republicans. You can look at it in our Adventist church. There are liberals and there's conservatives. You know, so you can, the Pharisees, Sadducees, you can use that in different ways. <coughs> but the question I have is... The Jews were God's true church on earth. They were, they were it. You know, they, they were no counterfeit. They were God's true church on earth. And yet, they crucified Christ and killed his disciples and, and uh, on and on. Rejected the message. And as we've talked about some of these, if you recall, when they rejected, remember... John the Baptist was the first angel. Christ himself was the second. And remember in early writings, if you reject the one, cannot be benefited by the second, the first and second angel's message. If you, were not, if you rejected John the Baptist, you could not be benefited by the teachings of Christ. And in the Millerite time period, if you rejected the first angel's message, you could not be benefited by the second. And then the consequences for those in the Jews' time, if you remember, they were left with their useless sacrifices. They sacrificed to a place where Christ was no more. And so they were left. They were in darkness. And they, they sacrificed to their useless sacrifices. In the Millerite time period, they were left with their useless prayers. They were praying to an apartment that Christ had left. He was no longer in the holy place. He was in the most holy place. And so there's consequences for if you reject these messages. And, and so in both cases, she says that, in first of all, in Christ's time, they literally crucified Christ. In our time, I'm sorry, in the Millerite time period, they crucified the messages. So both times, something crucified. As a result, 
rejecting the one, not being able to be benefited by the second. <coughs> and so each group of people did things they wouldn't normally do. And in the Jews' time in particular, they killed in the name of Christ, thinking they were doing God a favor. And in the Millerite time period, that didn't happen. But they crucified the messages, and they drove them from the churches, and they opposed and persecuted that kind of thing. In our time period, we know again there will be martyrs, and we know that. And, uh, and so I, I, I like to bring it home for us as Adventists, and we're gonna, I'm just going to say a couple things here. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, did they like each other? Do the liberals and the conservatives like each other? <laughs> you know, so, so they hated each other, and Christ could easily have exploited that when he was before their councils. And Caiaphas understood that, she tells us. He could have exploited that. He could have just said a few words and turned them against each other, and he could have just turned around and walked out. He could have done that. But he didn't do that, of course. And, uh, but they hated each other. And so when did they come? Do you remember when they became united? Do you remember there was an event that happened that caused them to become united in their enmity and their mission against Christ? Both of them came together, even though they hated each other. It was at the raising of Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus was raised to life. And we read, Pharisees and Sadducees were more nearly united than ever before. Divided hitherto, they became one in their opposition to Christ because of the raising of Lazarus. And if you recall with Lazarus, Lazarus, Christ had to let him get sick, and then he had to let him die before he could raise him to newness of life. And so it's a type, 144,000. It's a type of a people that, if you recall the story, the disciples and other people were astonished at Christ. He acted coolly towards, um, towards uh, Lazarus and his family. He just didn't seem to care. But he did care, and he let him die. He let him get sick, and he let him die, and then he raised him to life, and it was his crowning miracle here on earth. That's what, we, that's what the... That's what script, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy records. At that point is when the Pharisees and Sadducees came together in their opposition of Christ. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, but here it happened in front of them. They didn't believe in it. The Pharisees believed in one, but believed you had to earn it. You had to legally get it. And so it struck at the foundation of how they believed they were saved, to put it to terms for us. So liberals just classing it, not pointing anybody on it. That's none of my business. But there is a liberal element that doesn't believe that we're going to get victory over our sins. They don't believe that we're going to be resurrected to a newness of life. They don't believe that that's going to happen. There are the Pharisees, the conservatives, that believe that it has to happen, but they earn it. They're trying to, they're trying to do it by works. Both classes are wrong. But something will happen, and a class of people would be allowed to get sick, so to speak, allowed to get die, die to self, and be raised to a newness of life. And at that point, that's when the liberals and the conservatives will be united in their opposition. And if you recall, they didn't even want to just kill Christ. They wanted to kill Lazarus, too. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to make sure he died twice. You know, it's like it's not good enough. It was, so that tells you something of the enmity. So in this case, it's interesting to put that together when you think about how these elements came together as a result of this man being raised to life, Christ's crowning miracle, and uh, again symbolizing a group of people that actually have become righteous by faith. They've actually gotten it right. They've actually got sick. They went through the process. They died to self, and that's what happened to them. So these people come together to, with the idea of removing them, to take them out. A, an interesting point is that the introduction of Judas. So Christ is in these two people, these two classes have come against him, Judas now is the one that actually does the betrayal. And do you remember what Mrs. White has to say about, the, about Judas? She has a lot to say about Judas. Um, but Judas was one in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me just read this quickly. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, see if I can find it here. 
Satan is tempting Christ. The way he's in, and uh, it says, one of your own disciples, he's telling him what's going to happen. He's pressing this upon Christ. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. So Judas, when you stop and think about that, he's, he's one of the foremost in church activities. And he listened to your instruction, and he's the one that's going to betray you. And she goes on in many, many places to show that Judas was a false disciple, on and on and on, but he represents a class of people. He's a representative man, he and John both. So <clears throat> these liberals, conservatives, a class of people that have not overcome their sins, that have not let Christ do this for them, that have not gone through the process of Lazarus, come together. And there is the plotting against, there is the betrayal of. And, um, and the interesting thing is how this happens, and this is, again, what we're closing with, is how this happens. The, let me find it here. I can just read it instead of going through. In the Desire of Ages, Ananias and, Soph and Caiaphas, when they came together for the trial of Christ, there were two charges that they had to, that they tried to bring forth for Christ. One was blasphemy, which would secure the condemnation of the Jews. The other was sedition, which would secure the condemnation by the Romans. And she's very clear, the second charge they tried first, they, that's what they wanted to establish, because blasphemy could not execute Christ. Sedition could. And so they went for the second charge first. And it says, she goes on to say, they must make it appear that Jesus was working against the common law. Then he could be punished as a political offender. And so that's how this church went forward with Christ himself was to portray him as a political offender, you know, so that he could, they could secure the condemnation of the Roman government, which would then cause the execution of Christ. <clears throat> so Mrs. White goes on to let us know that she concludes that treason against the Roman government was the crime for which Jesus was condemned. That's in Desire of Ages, uh, page 772. So treason against the result of the Roman government was the crime that Christ was officially hung on. So for us, those who have not had the work done in their hearts, those of the, of the professing Adventist people and the other churches as well, there will come a point in time to where there will be a people soon that will have a, obtained righteousness by faith. And it will elicit the hatred of both groups and those who are uh, nominal professors of, of, our, of Adventism. They do not have the power to execute this class of people, but what they can do is portray them as political offenders and take them into the government. It's interesting in both Daniel 3 and 6, there were certain men that accused these people to the king, if you follow that. And so here, she goes on to say, there will come a time when because of our advocacy of Bible truth, we shall be treated as traitors, and we will be accused of disaffection toward the government. That's in the great controversy. So my point, my closing point, is that every one of us, this dragon, this thing that we read about, we speak about, that, that uh, lamb-like horns, very gentle, based on, the power, based on republicanism and Protestantism, at some point speaks as a dragon. And with us, all of us, we like, as long as we keep it out there with another entity, we're okay with that. But when it comes home to us, we can speak like that dragon too. And that's the point. And so the point being is that when we, in our own personal studies, it's like we want to be a Lazarus. We want to have the experience. We want to truly have righteousness by faith. We do not want to be because there will only ever be two groups. There will only be those. The one group, the one group will go on and give the message of God to the world. The other group will persecute, oppose, and kill them. You know, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And um, I think we'll have our, I'm sorry we went a little bit longer, and we'll have our closing song, and then we'll have prayer.